Tony Pickman lay in bed, ready for a full night's sleep. It had only been a year since he and his wife had moved in. How could things have gone so wrong? He thought about the presence in their home, and how his wife treated it as her daughter. He could feel that he wasn't wanted, maybe even hated. As Tony drifted off, his dreams were no escape. He saw a little girl pulling on his arm as if she were trying to get him out of bed and take his place. Don't be scared. She grew increasingly aggressive I just want to play a game with you. until her body morphed into a demonic creature with rotten flesh and worms crawling through her skin. Tony woke up terrified but took comfort that it was just a dream. Then, in the morning light, he saw bruises on his arm. They looked like fingerprints. The Missouri River carves a crooked path through Kansas's northeast corner. It's the only imperfection in the state's otherwise rectangular border, as if a bite were taken out of the once sharp edge. Just 300 yards from this river sits the most haunted home in Kansas, the Sally House. The Sally House holds claim to four recorded deaths, a storied fifth, and some of the most frightening supernatural encounters in the United States. This is its story. We cannot understand how the 508 property became the Sally House without dipping our toes into urban legend. Late one night, Dr. Charles Finney awoke to frantic pounding on his front door. When he ran downstairs, he found a desperate mother holding her ailing six-year-old daughter on his porch. She was suffering from terrible pains in her abdomen. Normally, Charles would point patients in life-threatening shape to the town hospital, but this young girl didn't have much time. He realized she was suffering from acute appendicitis. At any moment, her appendix would rupture. He brought her to the operating table and began to administer anesthesia, but Charles had to operate immediately. Far before the drugs took effect, he pushed in the blade and began his search through her abdomen. She could feel every cut as she kicked, flailed, and turned. Charles lost control of the blade. He kept searching, kept cutting, but she kept moving. Even as her mother tried to hold her down, more and more blood pooled on the table, and soon the kicking stopped. The surgery was a failure. The girl was dead. Her name was Sally. It's thought that Sally endured such a torturous experience that she was bound to the house and has remained there ever since. Don't be scared. I just want to play again. As the legend goes, when women inhabit the home, Sally tries to recover the childhood that was taken from her. But when men enter, she grows scared, defensive, and even violent. Over the next few years, Charles moved out of the house and became the mayor of Atchison. Shortly after his campaign ended in scandal, the home was host to another man's death. His sister Agnes now lived there with her husband. This man, William True, suffered a stroke while on vacation, and after three days of unconsciousness, he slipped away. Now widowed, Agnes spent the rest of her life alone in that house, and in 1939, at age 79, she died of natural causes. The home was now empty, its dark past unknown. For decades, women and children moved in and out without incident, but nearly a century after Sally's fateful night, it found its first male inhabitant. While house hunting, a brick home on 2nd Street caught the eyes of a young couple. It was a perfect fit for this soon-to-be family of three and they quickly jumped on the opportunity. The Pickmans spent the first month unpacking and furnishing the empty rooms. They were excited about their future and couldn't wait for their child to be born. But then it started. While watching TV on the couch, the living room light began pulsating, dimming to black and returning to full brightness. They changed the bulb and hired an electrician, but nothing seemed to fix it. Week after week, it kept happening. At the end of her rope, Deborah joked that they had a ghost. Just as the words left her mouth, the bulb flickered to life. Once their child was born, everything escalated. Their dog began growling at the nursery, 
Tony noticed inexplicable cold spots throughout the house. Electronic toys began turning themselves on and off, and the mobile above the crib would spin on its own. By July, it became unbearable. After visiting their in-laws, the couple returned home. They went upstairs to check the nursery and found all of their child-stuffed animals placed methodically, almost ritualistically, on the floor. They decided it must have been a prank by Deborah's sister Karen, who was in the home earlier that day. But on the phone, Karen was just as shocked. The toys weren't on the floor when she was there, and when she had entered the nursery to drop off a high chair, everything in her body went on high alert. It was as if her subconscious were screaming at her to get out of the house immediately. Shortly after, Deborah found a teddy bear placed carefully on the floor. This was the last straw. The couple invited Karen over, placed the bear back on the chair, and stayed side by side in case one of them was the culprit. After a few hours, Deborah volunteered to check the nursery. She stationed Tony and Karen at the bottom of the staircase where they could watch her back. She peeked into the room, and a wave of terror overcame her. The bear is on the floor again, she said. Everyone rushed up the stairs to see. There it was, staring at the ceiling just like before. When Deborah told her family about the strange occurrences, her mother contacted a previous renter of the home. While she didn't experience anything she thought was supernatural, she did remember toys mysteriously moving and her daughter playing with an imaginary friend named Sally. Can you see me? I'm here. Not knowing where to turn, the couple hired a psychic to evaluate their home. For several months, Sightings has been investigating a stunning paranormal event unfolding in America's heartland. We called in renowned psychic Peter James to see if he could communicate with the entity and make the haunting activity stop. The psychic informed them of a harmless spirit, a little girl who wanted toys, playmates, and parents. The psychic told the couple to give this spectral girl the childhood she wanted so long as Sally respected their rules. There's a little girl that's standing right there, right at the top of the stairs. Hello? This comforted Deborah, but Tony grew uneasy. Over the next few months, the couple, along with friends and family, saw more activity. Flickering lights, cold spots, agitated animals, orbs appearing in pictures, Worried about the safety of their child, they made plans to stay with family. While preparing to leave, Tony buckled his child into a car seat in the living room. Deborah suddenly felt a force shoot through her in the direction of her husband and son. Just then, Tony screamed and placed his hand on his back. They ran for the door, and later Deborah saw three bloody scrapes on her husband's back. The psychic reassured them that Sally was merely a child, and at her urging, they returned to the nursery to lay down the law. Deborah told Sally that she could continue playing with their family, but she had to behave. This felt wrong to Tony. His wife was beginning to see Sally as her daughter. Suddenly, all three of their cats looked over to a corner of the nursery as if something had entered the room. Sally was announcing her presence. The next few months saw an increase in activity. More lights flickered, more cold spots opened, and small fires were lit around the house. But Deborah continued to act like a parent reigning in her wild daughter. But things took a turn on Halloween night. After a late shift, Tony grabbed a drink and got ready to relax. But when he turned around, he realized a little girl had been standing behind him. She was translucent, wearing old-fashioned church clothes. It was Sally. He dropped his glass, and just as it shattered, she disappeared. Things continued to escalate from there. One night, while the couple was in bed, Tony heard heavy footsteps working their way up the staircase. He went to investigate, but suddenly felt a cold force go through him. He realized Sally had passed through him and entered the bedroom. That night, Tony had a terrible dream. He saw Sally pulling on his arm, getting more aggressive with each tug. 
On the final pull, she morphed into a demonic creature with rotten flesh and worms crawling through her skin. He woke up terrified, but reminded himself it was only a dream. Then, in the morning light, he saw small bruises around his arm. They looked like a little girl's fingerprints. Over the next few weeks, the couple began to worry that there were more spirits than just Sally in their home. Multiple orbs of light began appearing in their family pictures, and Tony saw a blonde woman pass a doorway while Deborah was on the other side of the house. The couple conducted a seance to confront the spirits face to face, but during the ritual, something scratched Tony across the forehead. An orb of light then entered the room and rested under the table. When they looked below, they found their child's lost pacifier with a melted tip. While Deborah continued to worry about Sally's safety, Tony was worried about his own. He had every right to be. Shortly after this seance, Tony was resting in preparation for his graveyard shift. He awoke to their waterbed violently jostling and a woman manifesting out of dust. He couldn't scream, and as she moved toward him and thrust her hands toward his face, he saw the door slam shut. He realized then it was the same blonde woman he had seen before. Suddenly, everything stopped, and the woman vanished. Over the next few months, many revelations would come to light. A film crew from the TV show Sightings began to check in on the Sally House regularly. They saw orbs, felt cold spots, and even witnessed Tony getting scratched. Everything was getting much worse. Tony's mind began to fill with dark thoughts. He wanted to hurt his pets, his wife, even his son. One night, he took a knife and stabbed his cat in the stomach. He watched it die, enjoyed it even. Suddenly, the impulse turned to his wife, Deborah, but just as quickly, it vanished. Tony was revolted by his actions, and he was terrified about what Deborah would think when she got home. But she never even realized the cat was missing. She was far too worried about Sally's safety. The tension in the home was unbearable. Someone was bound to get hurt, maybe even die. Later in the night, it would reach a fever pitch. As Tony was leaving the bedroom, something lifted him in the air and pushed him through the rails of the landing. If he hadn't caught himself, he would have fallen to the first floor and broken his neck. It was finally enough. As Deborah ran to his aid, she snapped out of her obsession. The couple agreed they would move out immediately. But Sally wasn't done yet. As the Pikmins left the house for the final time, Deborah felt impelled to take their child and run back in without Tony. But just as she turned around, she fought off the impulse, and the couple left the premises safely. Finally outside of the home's influence, Deborah wondered if Sally was as she seemed. Looking back over all their experiences, she became convinced that Sally was actually a demon, carefully disguised to win her trust. To this day, she wonders what its final intentions were.